Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program as we welcome Christian Schmieder. Christian's a qualitative research specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension. And we're going to talk to him about the Data Jam initiative. Welcome to the podcast, Christian. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so maybe we should start at the very beginning. What is a data jam? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, I have to explain that one a lot. Um, so uh, a data jam is basically a full day workshop where colleagues come together and analyze data together. So we're trying to create this space where we can work on real data, work on real projects using qualitative data analysis software to build capacity in qualitative research and using this type of software. So the game um, the data jams come from the idea of game jams. So in game jams, uh, game developers would meet for maybe one or two days and rapidly prototype ideas for games. So it's a very playful, but also very intense kind of experience where you test new ideas out, you work together, you maybe work together with people you haven't worked with, you get feedback from other groups. And we wanted to emulate this into a format for teaching um, or building capacity around qualitative evaluation and software. So you mentioned building capacity. Was there a pressing reason why uh, the initiative was necessary or how, you know, why uh, you sort of pursued it? Yeah. Um, you know, collecting data has become much more easy in the last 20 years. Uh, it's so easy to store large amounts, not only of, of quantitative data, but also of textual data. So if you think of you know, faculty activity reports, programming narratives, um, reports that go to stakeholders, it's very easy to store all that stuff. And it's very easy to store all these information, you know, all these pieces of data that are very unstructured. But analyzing them is harder. So we are accumulating a lot of data in the University of Wisconsin Cooperative Extension. We collect programming narratives and um, outcome statements from every educator every year. So we um, create almost five, 6,000 pages of, of textual data, of narrative data every year. And we don't collect those because it's fun to collect stuff. We collect them because we wanna do something with them. And with this kind of amount of data, it became necessary to really create capacity and literacy around using tools that can help you handle these large amounts of textual data. And that's where the initiative comes from. So we are, you know, we've talked about it's qualitative research. So we are talking about a lot of, a lot of textual mm -hmm. data. Are there other things other than like the programming narratives? Are there evaluation data, those kinds of things that are coming back as well? What, what kind of, what else encompasses the data set? Yeah, so the, so the, the data set that we're using typically is, the, is our central data collection um, data. So that's, like I said, the results narratives and impact statements. But the software itself can handle all kinds of qualitative uh, data. So, you know, we have colleagues who use it to analyze interviews, focus group discussions, um, we have colleagues who use it to analyze um, short answers from Qualtrics surveys or SurveyMonkey surveys. So if you do online surveys, so the software itself is really flexible and we're using the data jams to get people um, acquainted with and comfortable with the software itself. And so that could be that, you know, you maybe use uh, in the data jam, for example, the last couple of ones we did was with our um, Foodwise program, which is the um, uh, SnapEd FNAP program in Wisconsin. And we used the data that, that colleagues from this program had collected in our central data collection system. But now these colleagues who went through the data jam, now they know how the software works and they can use the software in their own, uh, in their own evaluations, in their, in their um, surveys that they do, interviews, group discussions, or document analyses too. So who attends a data jam? Like what's the set of people? Is it largely researchers, is it largely faculty, or is it a mix of people? I think it's a mix of people. So, of course, there's a group in our institution that is by, because of their history of who they are, as maybe they were researchers before, or they, they have a really strong background in methodology and, and, and research, especially social sciences research. 
Uh, and we have our evaluators because that's their job, but we're really trying to make this a space for everybody. So one of the issues I think um, that we have or we had before we started this was that evaluation is often seen as this other thing, right? It's like a thing that evaluators do. And, and the problem with that is that you always need context. If you send me a report about your work, let's say, you know, one page, there's a lot of stuff about your work that I don't know. So if I'm trying to read that, I'm, I'm always going to be a little bit off, right? And so what's important for us is to have people whose job it is or who are really having this affinity towards this analysis, but also bring the people who produce the data into the conversation, bring them to the data jam. So it's not like a place for evaluators. It's actually a place for everybody to come, to come in and analyze data together. And there might be people who say, you know what, this was a great experience, um, but I'm not, this is not what I'm normally doing, but they bring the context from their program areas or from their program in. So when we did the, the, the Foodwise data jams, we had the evaluators from Foodwise in there, but we also had um, program coordinators and educators in the room to analyze data together, to talk about the data together, to provide the context. So it's really an effort to increase the quality of the analysis because you're bringing everybody to the table. And that has really big impacts also on how colleagues see our central data collection. And they see, oh, look, somebody's actually using this data. That's great. Or, ah, these are the kind of questions you're asking. I'll keep that in mind next time when I write something. So it really helps to kind of set the stage to also increase the data quality. So you mentioned the software before, and you guys uh, are using Max QDA. How integral is the software to the data jam process? I think it's really important because the software is the kind of thing that everybody has in common. So we're not prescribing a method. You know, in some cases, we, we, we do say, okay, this is how we're going to analyze this. But somebody might come to us with interview data and that you have to analyze completely differently than you know, a bunch of faculty activity reports, right? But think about it more like a, a kitchen. So we are providing a kitchen, which is the software, and that kitchen always looks the same. Everybody has the same kitchen. Yeah? So if you come visit, if you live in an apartment building and you're visiting your neighbors and you go into their kitchen, their kitchen looks exactly the same as yours. You know, you've got your convection oven, you got maybe a regular oven, you got a gas range, you got the fridge, you, you know, there's a drawer for the, for the silverware. It's all the same. So if that person says, look, I need you to help me with that, with that meal, they're much better helpers than if they're in a kitchen that they have seen for the first time. I mean, if you go visit, you know, Aunt Jackie and Aunt Jackie just remodeled her kitchen, you're going to be more in the way. You can't even empty the dishwasher because you don't know where stuff goes. So the software creates that common space that everybody's in common. So that can help us understand the processes better. Because if I look at somebody moving around in their kitchen, even if I don't know what they're doing, I'm like, oh, okay, so they're going here, they're grabbing something from this place, they're setting it together here, they put it in the oven, I know how an oven works. So, so it helps us create almost like a technical bottom line of analysis that also then allows us to do analysis of work that other people have done. Because the cool thing about the software is that it retains the process. You write memos. A lot of people think qualitative data analysis software is something where you, you know, apply codes. Like I'm not talking about computer coding. I'm talking about tagging things, putting things into bucket. The software is really a writing tool. So it helps you and encourages you to keep notes of your process which means somebody else can look at your project and understand the process. And that someone else could also be you in three months when you're trying to figure out, wait, okay, we had this project, we worked on this, other things came up, what happened? And the cool thing is you have your data and your notes and all your products in one space connected, which helps you to pick up the work much faster. So when the teams gather at a data jam, you know, I think you mentioned this, they're, you know, they are sharing a set of data, right? They have something in common. They're working on their own project. Is that yep. right? It, how important has that been to sort of the success of data jams? I think it's been crucial. So I came to Extension as a consultant and methods teacher 
um, mainly teaching in academia, um, you know, and it was, it was a little bit of a culture shock um, because it's much more important to really do things that are directly relevant to our colleagues. That's something that I immediately learned. Like that was the first time we got a group together, our um, qualitative research community of practice. We got people together and we said, okay, let's do this. And the first thing in a test workshop was immediately like, okay, what is the value of this? Like with, with academics, it's often much easier to, to kind of skim over the idea, why is this even important or why does this help me? And in, I think in my experience as an extension, it has to be much more relevant. So I think using the data that is actually relevant for the educators, not only because the topic's relevant, because they can also get something immediately out of it. So that's really, you know, I earlier said this is about making products and this is like a game jam. You know, it's not just a work session. What we're trying to do is at the end of the, of the, of the data jam, we want to have a written product. It's a preliminary product. You're not going to the data jam being like, okay, one day and we're done with analyzing our data. That's not how it works. But we want to make sure that you read data, that you work with data. And at the end of the day, after you had all these great conversations, you still have a product, a written paragraph that summarizes your work. Because that's often what happens with this kind of data. It's like, especially if it's interesting, people start talking. They start talking for three hours and they say, okay, you talk for three hours, but now what? And so bringing the relevant data in, in connection with the software that kind of helps you keep notes. And we're obviously, you know, telling people like, okay, if you're talking for more than two minutes, better write down something. So like to have these like reflective writing habits on top of that, that really helps us to make this relevant to colleagues because they can come back and say, look, this is what we found. Yeah. It's not generalizable knowledge at this point, but it's something that we learned from the data that's directly relevant to our work or to our program development. And that is really empowering. And I think that's what brings people back to not only the data jams, but to the idea of, hey, let's use these data. Let's use textual data. Let's use qualitative analysis to, to uh, inform our work and do our in, uh, evaluations and communicate with our stakeholders. Is that something that uh, people in extension uh, in your state have been hesitant to do or just not familiar with in terms of using qualitative versus quantitative data? I think it's really more of a general, um, it's more of a general kind of, um, yeah, overemphasis of quantitative, quantitative style research. I'm not gonna say uh, quantitative research. You know, we, we tend to, yeah, I think, I think qualitative data is being heavily underused um, in many social sciences um, areas. I think in extension, at least from my perspective, there are a lot of people who uh, have done this kind of work, who are passionate about this kind of work, um, you know, we have ethnographers, anthrop anthropologists, um, sociologists in our institution. And, and I think what's been lacking was a kind of like a common, common language and a common uh, space to gather and to do this work and to share a space where you can be passionate about this kind of work. Um, and I think aside from that, it was not really seen and that's again, that's, I think that's not an extension issue. That's a general issue of qualitative research. It wasn't seen as, as rigorous or as uh, powerful in terms of its, uh, in, per, in terms of its uh, outcomes. And I think that's the, the problem is really when we talk about qualitative and quantitative research is that both sides, even, even calling them sides is a problem, but both sides, you know, we tend to point out the best work done in our tradition and we contrast it with the worst work done in the other. And I think that is, a, that is just a problem. And I think what we're doing is we're really exposing more, more colleagues to how this work really looks like, how rigorous it really needs to be done. I mean, that's one of the things where as a consultant, I mean, this is, the, this is what you always hear. It's like, okay, I've got all this data and I've not, I don't have a lot of time. Which in qualitative research, you don't need a lot of data but you need a lot of time to analyze the data. 
So, so starting this process and starting this kind of culture of creating these spaces and also helping um, colleagues understand right off the bat when they start a pro project, you know, you don't need to do 40 interviews. Like do, do 10, analyze your data, and then maybe from there you could maybe even do a, an online survey with quantitative items. Yeah, so to kind of really bring across that qualitative research is not this weird, uh, ungraspable and very esoteric thing, but it's actually a process that you can do and a process that you can do using a kind of tool that actually, I think that actually is fun to use and empowering to use. I have a, uh, many questions in my head here, so I'm gonna try and pick one. Um, so let's talk about the products. Uh, are there, have there been particular products that have resonated with you that have come out of the data jam or maybe even insights um, that have come as the result of, of sort of putting these teams together in this environment? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with one that's reflecting some of the challenges we have as an institution. And again, I think that's not a, I think that's a challenge that, every big institution has, which is a question of how do we design and maintain an organizational language? An organizational language that is not an organizational language that uh, is top-down generated and revised every three years because, because that's what happens. Right? So that's really why we collect our data in our central data collection system, the qualitative one, because we want to work towards an organizational language. So one of the biggest, you know, insights in a way is that you know we did an analysis of poverty so there was the um, north central uh, uh, extension um, region that wanted to know okay how is extension uniquely positioned to um, address the issue of poverty so we did a series of three data jams and said okay let's look at poverty from different angles like let's see what we got um, we looked at our results narratives and we typed in the search term poverty you yeah. we found now well, maybe 30 40 results narratives mm. like if, if i would have 100 extension educators in a room and i would ask how many of you think that your work is related to the issue of poverty probably 95 would raise their hand <laughs> so so what's going on mm -hmm. so we'd be expanded the search you know we'd be, because in order to create a data set out of this big data set we need to sample so we looked for other terms, you know, like some things like free and reduced lunch, you know, and we found a lot of different stuff. And so that was something, you know, that's something that's not unknown for the institution, but it's really powerful to share that with colleagues and with, and with, I mean, with all levels of colleagues from the educator to, you know, to high level administration to say, okay, look, we got to do something here. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we are uniquely positioned to address the issue of poverty. Why? Because we address poverty in so many different angles, right? So our weakness, again, our weakness actually is that we're so diverse in our approaches and, and you know, basically our systemic attack towards this problem, but also that has the problem that we're actually not speaking a, a common language. So like, you know, these kind of things, even showing where we have issues, if you do that, based on an actual analysis of data that, that helps really to drive the process institutionally. So that's, you know, I think that's one powerful thing that we found. Um, another thing is, again, to prepare data sets that allow us to uh, analyze things much more quickly. So we did a four day data jam session with evaluators from all program areas. And what we did is we created Search term, search term collections for different data sets that then could be analyzed quicker by colleagues who are interested in certain topics, right? We, we connect collecting all those data, but it's so much of it. So that's another kind of product or outcome that helps actually make data more accessible and more digestible. A third thing that I think I should mention is um, the work we're doing, we're doing with the civil rights uh, leadership team. So we want to know as an organization, how can we, like, what are we doing in reaching out to underserved and non-traditional audiences? What are best practices? What are barriers? Where are we doing well? Where are we not doing well? 
So the data jams um, allow us to have data jams with that topic. And we're using, you know, the data jams are not just like one time workshops. We also do four day data jams. We use the curriculum in a, in a graduate class that just ended last week. And that's another thing is like we can actually bring people together, people from extension, students, work at the data together and then have an exchange around the data. So their papers, and I think that's one of the bigger impacts are now have informed our, our civil rights review that we had a couple months ago. And they ha are now informing the work that our director of diversity and inclusion, Shelley King Curry is doing. So we're really kind of getting, you know, getting the data or making the data like a usable tool. And that's kind of similar with the WNEP, uh, with the uh, Foodwise data jams where, you know, our evaluators in Foodwise, they want to make sure that every county is able to run evaluations based on the needs that they see locally. And so exposing people to the software and to the methodology helps seeding that kind of process. That was long-winded, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's great. And I, I, you've already talked about some of, the, you know, some of that address, some of the long-term impacts, I guess. Um, are there specific ways or, or specific evidence in terms of attendees carrying, or even as teams carrying this work forward outside of uh, the data jam? Um, I would say so. Yeah. Um, you know, part of that is the format of the consulting that we do on top of that. So it's not, you know, like the whole thing is, you know, we call it the data jam initiative, but it's not just data jams. So, you know, what would happen, for example, we would have um, a couple of colleagues come to data jams and then a couple of months later they say, okay, we've got this data set that we, that we created um, and we have a team. Can you help us set up, set up the analysis. So then we would say, okay, let's do a data jam just for the team. And then you do your analysis for a couple of, couple of weeks. And then maybe we bring in more colleagues and do a data jam for, for everybody. Um, and then you keep doing your analysis. So, so the idea is really to have, um, to kind of give this structure to do this work outside of the data jams. They're almost just like the kind of we're kind of seeding, you know, it's like when you're, when you're cooking caramel and, you know, and there's a little crystal forming and all the other crystals like build up on it. Um, that's what we're trying to do. And, and that is, that is happening because there's a series of projects that are ongoing right now that came out of either the data jam initiative or were part of the data jam initiative. Because basically what we're doing on a ground level is structuring analysis sessions. We're enabling uh, colleagues to, be able to sit together and block out time and also see the value of blocking out that time to sit together and analyze data in a group and to actually at the end of the day, have something tangible afterwards. Like it's really about the analysis group. And I think that's really important because a lot of this work happens separated alone. Like we do a lot of research alone. That's for qualitative research. It's really a bad idea because we really want to have different perspectives and that goes back to the thing I said earlier that we have people who do qualitative research, but we also want to bring them together. We really want to build this community and we want to build these safe spaces for analysis where you can say, you know what, we're going to block out four days. That's one of the things where a lot of people, when we first did our four day data jam, a lot of colleagues were like saying, oh, this sounds great, but it's not going to work because nobody has four days. Mm -hmm. But we were actually overbooked. We had actually to turn down teams because there are a lot of colleagues who see the value of this kind of, let's make a safe space. Let's, let's block out some time. You know, we'll maybe do a half an hour of emailing every day, but let's really focus on this work. And I think that is something that it has nothing to do with qualitative or quantitative research. It's generally creating spaces in extension to, to experiment with research and to dedicate to research, um, you know, where you have the feeling like, you know what, I have time for this. I can engage with this. I can dig in. That's really, that's really what we're trying to get at. Let's talk a little bit about the toolkit. You guys have created this data mm -hmm. jam toolkit. What's in the toolkit? Who's it for? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the toolkit is um, a, um, it was, sponsored or, or um, uh, 
supported by the e extension um, with uh, money from the USDA. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, okay, data jams, great idea, works well for us. Does it work well for others as well? You know, like, can we scale this up? And if we want to scale this up, what would it take to scale it up? So what we did is we took our curricular materials and our process materials and modified them so that they are understandable for people who don't, haven't been part of building this whole thing. So, you know, the data jam rhythm is really like we do a monthly data jam and then several other data jams on the site that are topical. But it's actually a rhythm. So, you know, so you, um, like three weeks before, you make sure that you contact the data host. You talk to them about their research question. You talk to them about, okay, what kind of piece of data do we maybe want to look at? Um, you know, write a paragraph about your research so we can get an overview quicker than you talking for an hour and a half about what's really, really exciting to you and to everybody, but that takes so much time. Uh, then we work with a local, with a local um, location. Oftentimes we do data jams in two locations simult simultaneously. You know, then you um, send out the invitations, then you do the data jam the week afterwards, you refine the product a little bit, then you post a blog post, then you do the, so there's this whole rhythm. So we took all these materials that help build up that rhythm, you know, how much time it takes, what you need to have in place. You know, week one, you do this, week two, you do this. It's kind of like straw bale gardening, you know, like just, the different things that you need to check off the list. Um, we added um, a couple of videos, training videos, overview videos to Max QDA products, because that's really important to show, to see the idea of like, okay, look at the beginning of the workshop, this is the kind of product you're gonna make. So we added a couple of products um, and um, yeah, and a couple of videos that, that I made as a, as a webinar that, were, that we cut up in like seven minute kind of short bursts so that um, people from outside the institution can kind of get a feel for what is, what is a data jam even. So that's what's in the toolkit right now. The toolkit is right now available to extension institutions who request access to it. So we have eight right now that have access to it. For everybody else, there's a couple of materials that are open access, but while it's really in this early development stage, we kind of keep a lid on it. Um, but we've done data jams. So I've done a data jam in Washington state with a colleague. Um, and actually next week we're going to have a data jam that's uh, done in the Minnesota extension by their evaluation team that we're trying to support remotely. So that's another thing where we're trying to figure out, okay, this is really complex stuff. And it's not really just about the software or just about the method. It actually need, it actually requires institutional buy-in. So there's all kinds of levels that are not yet directly addressed by the curriculum. Um, you know, like how, you know, what are the strategies to integrate this in an institution? You know, who are the people you want to talk to? We actually created a workshop for that, that we delivered at the American uh, Educational Research Association's uh, yearly meeting um, just four weeks ago, where we did a workshop for people who re run research labs to kind of help them through the process of like, okay, what do I have in place? What's the infrastructure? Who do I need to talk to? And that curriculum is also going to be part of the, of the data jam toolkit. So what's your vision for how this evolves in the future? Do you have an idea of, of what the data gem initiative might accomplish or what it might look like in a year or two from now? Um, so institutionally, internally, um, I want to stay, take a step back. It's been a year and a half almost, and we're doing evaluations right now. I mean, we're on, evaluation is ongoing, but we're analyzing interviews right now with uh, educators, um, reflect on what they're saying and uh, give the curriculum an overhaul. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, every data gem is different and we take a lot of notes and, you know, kind of get these notes together and like maybe think about a couple of additional modularizations. Aside from that, I really think that this jam model, uh, it would be great if it would be applied to a broader, to a broader context and broader context. So, you know, for example, the Washington state data jam was a data jam where we analyzed qualitative data in max QDA with the goal of feeding our coding decisions to an algorithm so that the algorithm can learn how we conceptualize issues around climate change. So basically it was an idea to like, how can we build a mechanism 
that helps an algorithm tag things and also that we can use as quality control for the algorithm. You know, so that's a whole nother like playing field. Again, it's a, it's a space where you need to sit down and analyze data first before you can start. The same thing is with quantitative. I think this gem model works really well also with quantitative um, uh, data. So for example, um, there's, a, there's a great initiative that's called the Data Tapestry, which is, I think it's out of Ohio. Don't quote me on that, Google it. Google it, cross check it. It's called Data Tapestry and they do um, workshops and curricula around um, statistical software, um, mainly R. Yeah? So it's a, it's a similar kind of idea where you go to a place and you look what people have for, for data needs and you work with them to kind of work on their real problems and to, through that build the capacity and the, also the excitement, the momentum around this very complex professional tool. So I would love to see data jams around, um, you know, quantitative data analysis, you know, like maybe with Excel or with software, like MaxQDA, for example, has also quantitative, very basic quantitative functions. So you can do, you can run an ANOVA or something like that. So I would like to see more of that across the board and it not only just be limited to qualitative analysis and really spark this idea of creating spaces where we can engage with research that are meaningful and not like crammed in between two meetings. That's great. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Christian Schmieder is a qualitative research specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension. You can find out more about the Data Jam initiative at fyi.uwex.edu slash data jams. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. You can get more information about Working Differently in Extension on Twitter. We're at WDNEXT, all the podcasts on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently, and the show notes at bobbirch.com. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.